Hello everybody, the Nameless Narcissist here once again. A simple man diagnosed with MPD talking about some of the confusion regarding narcissistic personality disorder. Now keep in mind I'm no clinician, I can only speak to my own experiences, but hopefully I can give you some insight into how my head works. And if you like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. So we're talking about hoovering today. What is hoovering? I'm not even sure myself, I'm being honest. I was actually kind of confused on this term because a very common theme that I see with some of these uh, kind of buzzwords when it comes to how narcissists behave is that they get the motivations completely wrong even if the observable behavior is similar. So it's hard for me to recognize it, it when I'm like reading about it, uh, at least in myself. And that also is complicated by defensive grandiosity and self-deception to protect and shame. Um, but basically from what it seems, it's hoovering is a at least a perceived uh, behavior that people with MPD exhibit to try to get people back into their lives in a way that doesn't elicit shame, more or less, like a subtle way of doing it, uh, usually is how it's presented, or in some of these examples I'm going to read off, um, not so subtle ways, but it's framed as manipulation in a lot of ways, and I don't necessarily agree with that, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, that I looked up Hoovering and just pulled the first article I could. It was like, nine ways to recognize Hoovering and how to respond. And so I'm going to go through that list and see how these line up with my behaviors. And then afterwards, I'm going to talk about a situation I had with an ex where my observable behavior probably would be perceived as Hoovering. Whether or not that's accurate, I'll let you guys decide. So um, the first thing that they said is a sign is love bombing. Um, I have a huge issue with this term, if I'm being honest, not because it can be kind of manipulative, I guess, especially because of some of the um, purposefulness behind it, but you have to keep in mind that people cluster B disorders. We did not grow up in households where we felt loved um, or appreciated or much of anything. We had a bad time, and so we are constantly seeking to find that relationship that's basically going to be like, this is... This is all the love, the unconditional love that I craved growing up, right? And which is not a fair thing to ask of anybody, obviously. But that leads us to get very attached very quickly. So when I am like, if I'm like very infatuated with somebody and very much like going for them, this is a like, it isn't happening super often with me because I'm way more on the MPD side. This is more of a BPD trait. Um, but it's a very genuine feeling. I'm very much like, oh my gosh, this person is perfect. They're going to accept me for who I am. I'm like having grandiose fantasies about like uh, us like running away to Europe <laughs> or some shit, right? These are very genuine things. But then when you're in the relationship for a while, it doesn't live up to the unfair expectation put on these people. We, that starts to go down. It's like, oh, this isn't my soulmate. This person isn't perfect for me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which obviously can probably cause somebody some whiplash. But then to relate it to hoovering, um, when this person like, especially if they try to lead me, there's this combination of like, um, how do I even put it? Like one, it bruises my ego, so already. But also like this idea of like, oh my God, I want the perfect one get away. How could I be so dumb? Why I take them for granted, yada, yada, yada. And in desperation, try to get this back. I become almost convinced I'm in love with this person if they leave me first, if I'm being honest, which because them leaving me is proof of my own lack of worth. And there's a little bit of difference between that and like fear of abandonment, if I'm being honest. Um, with NPD, I've noticed it's more of a fear of rejection rather than a fear of abandonment that you see in BPD. And they're very similar, but there's a, there's a little bit more nuance to it. I'm not going to get into it super much right now, but yeah, like, I don't know, love bombing, maybe that's hoovering, who fucking knows. Um, <laughs> two, uh, dramatic declarations, basically. It's similar with the love bombing stuff. It's like, oh my god, I love you so much, yada yada. I view this, again, more as a BPD thing than an MPD thing. I would be way too, I'd be too afraid to very openly and dramatically say how I felt about somebody. I'm going to be kind of like asking questions or saying things that, I'm, that kind of let me ascertain what they're feeling about me before I would do anything like that. But again, if I did do that, that probably means that I got some sort of affirmation from you that I am worthwhile. And thus, what I'm expressing is very genuine, at least in that moment. Um, three accusations. Um, I imagine this is like, you get an aggressive text or somebody. Um, this is, this is the one on this list. I'm like, yeah, I do that. I can't, I can't even deny it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a mix of things because it's like, I'll, I'll like bring up very aggressively all of the perceived in my head, the perceived like misgivings that these people have all these like, uh, 
the wrongs that they've been committing against me, right? Because in my head, those are very real. But there's also like a layer of it beneath it that I don't like to admit. I don't think even anybody in my life really knows this. But when I do something like that, there's a part of me that's like, please just like call me out on my bullshit and tell me that like you still want to be in my life, basically. There is like a level of I want them back in my life, but there's also the level of like I can't show that, so I have to be defiant. I have to show them that I don't need them. They have to need me. Um, super toxic. I'm not even defending that behavior, and I don't want to do that anymore, but I'm sure that's not a universal experience of people with NPD. Some of these things uh, other people with NPD that I don't do, other people with NPD may do, and maybe they don't do that one. Um, four, threatening self-harm or suicide and stuff. Yeah, again, this is this one is literally diagnosed in the diagnostic criteria a BPD thing. Um, again, there's a lot of overlap between MPD and BPD, so it's like, yeah, sure, I guess it could apply sometimes. Um, people with cluster B disorders, though, are very emotional. We are very, our emotions are very intense all the time, and more so on the BPD side, again. But if somebody with a cluster B disorder is saying they're willing to commit suicide, yes, this may be a manipulative tactic it's more likely they genuinely think they're going to kill themselves, if I'm being honest. So they are genuinely feeling enough hurt to want to do that. And I don't really like this article implying that, like, oh, anytime somebody says they're going to hurt themselves, then that's just a manipulation tactic, because you don't know. What if they're, like, being very serious and you're the only person that they feel comfortable saying that to? I'm not saying it's your responsibility to, like, go in and save them. Like, that's probably the worst thing you could do. Um, I mean, honestly, you should probably just call the police at that point. My grandma had, like, uh, some cluster, really, really bad cluster B shit going on. And, like, once a week, she called my dad being like, oh, I want to kill myself. And my mom once con eventually convinced someone they were still together to just be like, well, I don't know how to handle that, Barb, so I'm going to call the police. I hope you're okay. Um, and it works better than just constantly trying to talk her down, so take from that what you will. Um, again, that's not really an NPD thing, though. I would, wouldn't threaten suicide just because it's like, uh, to, well, I guess for me and my personal experience, it's like, it's too attention grab. Like, it, if I'm going to, I don't think people are going to take me seriously if I threaten suicide, I guess. So I try not to. Um, which is like, even if I am feeling suicidal, that's a whole thing. I don't even want to get into that either. Um, random calls or text messages out of the blue. This one kind of confused me. Um, because do people just not randomly text and call people that they care about? I guess if like they're estranged or not in good terms. Um, if I were to do this, it would definitely be like, oh, this is an olive branch. If I am like estranged from somebody, I send a text that has n that is like not even relevant to how I am like to like the fight that led to us being estranged from each other. That's me, that's a now olive branch right there. That's me trying to say, yeah, I fucked up and I wanna talk about this, but I am too ashamed and too afraid of um, rejection and embarrassment to be honest. And like, again, that's not the best thing either, but I don't know, that one felt kind of bizarre. Um, fake gossip. Um, they said that, so basically in the article, I'm pretty sure they said that like, using triangulation, basically trying to turn other people against you to get you back and if I'm being honest with this one, the only way that I would like start spreading rumors about somebody is if I'm fucking done with them, right? This isn't me. At that point, it's not me. I might forgive them if they do come back still, but that's not me trying to get somebody back. That's me being vindictive and thinking, oh, this person fucking wronged me. I want them to suffer. And again, not that's not good. <laughs> I'm not trying to defend that behavior. That is the only motivation I can see with something like that. I can't imagine spreading rumors about somebody in hopes that they come back to my life. I could see me talking to a mutual friend and like saying and dropping hints that I want to talk to that person again in hopes that they would tell the person I'm trying to talk to in hopes that they would initiate something. Um, but slandering them, no. Um, and then big promises. This kind of goes on with the dramatic declarations. Like the again, like for people with MPD and BPD too. It's like, oh, everything's big. Everything's, for us grandiose, for everything with BBD, everything's like, you know, overwhelming and emotional. Um, and so when I'm being like, oh my God, like we can go like, again, run away to Europe. <laughs> like that was actually a good example. Um, we, or, oh, like I've changed or whatever. I'm willing to do anything. To get you these are real in the moment. Like these aren't us trying to manipulate people. This is literally us thinking, yeah, this is like the reality, right? Um, I don't know what this whole thing is about like, 
people with MDD don't feel. We're literally in the dramatic and emotional and erratic cluster. We're emotional. <laughs> uh, we try to hide it a lot and we don't like being called emotional because that makes us feel weak. Uh, but there are a lot of times that we feel emotions very intensely and so we try to cover them up with anger, either subconsciously or sometimes consciously. Not very often, but sometimes consciously. <laughs> um, yeah, like, apologize saying that they've changed is number eight, so I just basically said that already. Yeah, we think that, we think that we've changed, right? Um, and, but it's like, but in reality, we're just masking harder, right? And we don't, but we don't recognize that that's what we're doing most of the time. We think that's what it means to change, it's just changing behavior, and to that, so that makes sense. And I'm not sure if that doesn't make sense to other people, because, but then, like, because it's not this, since this change is purely for the basis of, like, okay, I'm doing wrong, I need to fix it, but we don't really see things wrong with what we're doing, it's just we know that that's the accepted thing to do, what we should do. You can't keep it up very consistently if you have like a close relationship with somebody, at least in my experience. And then, t -t 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 creating fake crises, that basically goes along with the uh, suicidal threats and stuff. Um, I don't think I need to say anything more about that. Uh, yeah, I didn't like this article, it wasn't very good, and I was struggling to kind of find even a better one, but I thought this was a good opportunity to say like, Hey, remember, these articles are kind of bullshit. It's pop psychology. Keep that in mind. Now, I will say, now, bringing it back, though, to my ex that I mentioned earlier and how some of my behaviors were, had to, would probably be interpreted as hovering. And that because I'm not going to say that, like, I don't try to do that, where I try to almost, where I have tried in the past, at least, to kind of sneakily get somebody back into my life without showing that I actually, like, care, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, because again, showing that care and showing that vulnerability, that's difficult. And if, especially if I'm rejected in that attempt, that's overwhelming shame that I can't tolerate. So I try to basically worm around it. Um, so I'm going to relate this to my one ex. Uh, I mentioned her in a video, actually. I reached out to her relatively recently in at least what I thought was a genuine way. And her response was, <laughs> I, she was like, why are you contacting me? And I was like, I don't know, I had an impulse and just kind of wanted to, which was true. Like, that was probably the most honest I've ever been with her. <laughs> and she was like, I see you haven't changed much. I'm like, yeah, fuck off. And she was like, but I don't believe you. Like, you would only reach out if you thought you, you could get something. And I was like, damn, this bitch got an even worse opinion of me than I thought. This was a mistake. <laughs> um, but, okay, so after me and her broke up, um, there was a period after we broke up, I was very melancholy. I didn't really like, feel sad about it because I, I kind of orchestrated the breakup just because I couldn't handle making the breakup myself. So I was kind of like forced her in a position where she had a breakup with me. I'm not proud of that. But as I'm like sitting there, I'm like, like just brooding. I'm like, ah, I fucked up. Why did I do that? Why did I break up with her for this other girl that isn't even like, that it's like super bad for me. This girl was like super good for me and I messed it up. And so I like had a lot of regret about it. I didn't really want to get back with her, but I wanted to like make amends at least and like have her back in my life. Because even though that was probably for the because of the shame of what I did and wanted to make amends just to avoid that and for self-esteem regulation, I was still very much like my conscious process w wasn't as much in that regard. I am I've always been aware that like I desperately need attention and validation, but I didn't realize that I didn't understand the difference between I still really don't the difference between making amends so that I can avoid shame and then making amends out of genuine guilt. Because what I should have recognized is that it's not fit, it's not fair for me to kind of in, impede on boundaries like that, right? Um, I should have recognized that like, since it's better for them, it'd be better for them if I didn't reach out and try to make amends, which doesn't feel right, but whatever. But so what I would do is <sighs> finding excuses to text them would be a big thing. Um, I will say that like these declarations of having changed, yeah, I have done that because one, I thought it was genuine, and two, it was an excuse to reach out to them without being openly vulnerable. Um, how it, the first time I tried to contact this girl again was I saw her on Tinder and I was like, eh, I wonder, and I swiped right and we matched again, I'm like, oh, yes. <laughs> and I sent her a message, I was going to wait and see if she messaged first to kind of feel that out. I was like, eh, I'm going to balls to the wall, let's do it. And so I said, you look a lot like my ex, which I thought was hilarious. Um, and whatever. We had a conversation and like my, I wasn't willing to like, I wasn't willing to be outright and be like, oh, like I have a lot of regrets and I'm sorry. My 
and it came out in a really poor way. She took it well at the time, but I think her opinion on it changed over time too. As after, after I felt, felt it out and like she wasn't overtly hostile at this point, I sent like a long, I was like, do you mind if I say something? And she was like, oh uh, sure. And I sent a very long message basically being like, oh, I've done so much growth and you helped me so much, blah, blah, blah. Like very much praising her and telling her how much of a like, good influence she was in my life. And I didn't recognize how that was insensitive and how like I would, well, that wasn't an apology, right? That was just me like flattering her effectively because that's what I would want to hear. I want to hear people's flattery. I want them to tell me how great I am, how they always will remember me, whatever. Um, and it was hard for me to like wrap my mind around that other people would want different things. And that again, it was probably not a good thing to tell my ex like, I'm doing so much better now, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, whatever. But yeah, none of that though was like me maliciously being like, I need this person for attention. It was, there was a lot of shame avoidance in it and there were a lot of factors in it that were like, yeah, I do want attention from this person. But all the emotions I was feeling were, at least to me at the time, very genuine. Um, and a lot of it was confusing because, you know, I don't know my own emotions, whatever. Maybe there are some narcissists who do things like, don't get me wrong, I can be very Machiavellian. I can be very manipulative. I'm aware of these things. But in these, I would never tell somebody that I love them in a way to manipulate them. I just wouldn't. Um, that's vulnerable and weak and like really dumb because what am I getting out of that? I'm not going to tell somebody I love them if I don't want them around. You know what I mean? If I'm just using something for self-esteem regulation, there are other ways to go about that. Um, and the idea that like I would enter a more romantic relationship just to secure them as a source of self-esteem regulation I did it once, but I was like super desperate for self-esteem regulation at that point, and I immediately regretted it and got out of it. Um, but like the idea that like every time I go through a breakup that I'm literally just like, oh, I don't have as much attention as I used to. I mean, maybe subconsciously, but I'm not consciously being like, oh, I need this source of attention. Anyways, I hope that made sense, and I hope this is helpful in understanding what's going on through people with MPD's head when behaviors like this are taking place. Important to remember that we're not always super cunning. We can be, but you know. Anyways, I uh, hope you all have a good day. Take your fucking meds.